Hello and welcome to Credit Matters TV. I'm Jeff Sexton for Standard & Poor's Insurance Ratings. Today I'm joined by Mark Trench, Director and Accounting Specialist for Standard & Poor's Insurance Ratings for a discussion of the volatility introduced into the financial results of U.S. life insurers by the presence of non-performance risk. Mark, thank you for joining us. Mark, to start off our discussion, how do we define non-performance risk when it comes to U.S. life insurers and what is the accounting concept behind it? Okay, so basically you have a situation where um, when you fair value liabilities, the, one of the components is non-performance risk. And uh, the, the best way to describe it is in terms of the asset first. So when you fair value an asset, there's um, a lot of components that go in liquidity risk, there's discounted cash flows, credit risk, performance risk. Performance risk in the context of an asset is whether the counterparty will actually perform under the contract. And therefore you have to include that in the price into the fair value of, of the asset. Now look at it from a liability standpoint. Liability, the performance risk actually refers to the entity itself performing, whether they will make good on their, um, on their obligation. Uh, so in the U.S. life insurance uh, industry, the, you have guaranteed products, and mostly it's the withdrawal benefits on uh, variable annuities. These products, uh, or the accounting requires that the guarantee be fair valued. So therefore, these, the U.S. life insurers have to incorporate the risk of them not performing on their own obligation. And many of them use credit spreads to do this. And this is where the issue comes in. Um, so when a company's credit spreads have narrowed, uh, the company's healthier from the market perceives them as being healthier as far as paying their, paying on their obligations. Um, the when you fair value that the non-performance component actually results in a loss, um, and this is this counterintuitive notion, and, and it mostly comes from the fact that if if the uh, U.S. life insurer were to go out into the market and sell this liability market participants would factor this into the price. The problem is we don't have markets for these guarantees. Um, they're not robust, they're not liquid, they don't really exist. So they have to use a proxy for this. And this is where the issue comes in, um, that you have non-performance risk uh, resulting in these very significant swings. Taking that into account what you just said about credit spreads with regards to U.S. life insurers and bearing in mind the accounting concept behind it, what do these swings in profits and losses tell us about U.S. life insurers? Well, it, it's interesting because uh, we had one example where a very large U.S. life insurer in the first quarter had about a $2.3 billion loss. Uh, second quarter, they had a $3 billion gain all coming from this non-performance risk component. So uh, it, the swings are so severe and can be so large, it, it's actually in some instances hard to actually tell what, what is going on. I mean, really uh, what's happening is the market sentiment has changed and therefore credit spreads have been affected. Um, and thus you get these large swings. Uh, one thing I should point out, not all companies use credit spreads as a proxy. Um, some, of, some companies are in situations where the credit spreads are so wide and vary so much that they actually um, look to other indicators uh, such as the reinsurance market to, um, to fair value their, their liabilities and to reflect this component, this non-performance risk component. And they, as you can imagine, show less volatility in their results. To help assuage those investor concerns that you mentioned uh, and encounter these swings, what type of hedges do U.S. life insurers use against non-performance risk? Yeah, that's a very uh, short answer. They, they don't. <laughs> they don't hedge that risk. And um, it actually makes sense. They, they have very robust hedging programs. They hedge interest rates. They hedge uh, foreign currency. They hedge credit risk. Um, they do not hedge non their own uh, non-performance risk. And when you think about it, why would they go out and buy a hedge on themselves not performing? They, they are functioning under the concept that they're a going concern. So 
it, it, it's counterintuitive to a, a healthy company to go out and buy protection against you not meeting your obligations. So, you know, the short answer is they don't hedge against this risk. But given this illusion of volatility that happens from these swings between profits and losses, um, is this possibly something that we could see addressed by the accounting standard setters to kind of remove it? Yeah, I mean, it, it came about because of the standard setters. Back in 2007, they actually issued guidance that said, this is the way you must fair value. And this is when this uh, non-performance component was, was introduced um, into, the, into the valuation of, of uh, into the fair va when you fair value liabilities. So um, they are currently working on two projects that would affect insurers. Uh, the first is the insurance contracts project. Within that project, they have actually, um, the, the measure they have come up with on how to measure insurance contracts is fair value like. And I say fair value like because the big difference is they do not require that you include non performance risk. So it is not fair value. Um, it, is, uh, it is a better measure for those insurance contracts. So you won't see swings in uh, swings due to this non performance risk. Uh, the other project is the financial instruments project. Um, which would address your asset side, um, your, your um, investments. And in that case, actually, it cover, I'm sorry, it covers investments and it covers liabilities, um, financial instruments aside from insurance contracts. So in that instance, um, they, have, uh, they have proposed that the effects of non-performance risk run through other comprehensive, other comprehensive income in your equity section. So they're, they're addressing in two different ways, but they're definitely hearing what investors, what preparers are telling them about um, some, of, you know, some of the issues that this is causing uh, for, for companies when explaining their results. So finally, bringing it back to S&P, what's our view of non-performance risk and what could that mean for U.S. life insurer ratings going forward? Um, our view is we look through the effects of uh, the non-performance risk. Um, that, that's the sweet and simple answer there. However, um, one of the things, we, we, we do look at it and, and keep track of it because of indirect effects. So you could have a situation where the swings are so volatile that equity investors um, are, are either confused or concerned about what's going on at the company. And if they start selling and the shareholders equity starts dropping that's obviously a concern for us and our metrics so um, you know all in all we look through it but we're also cognizant of, of the I guess collateral damage um, these effects can cause so something we're watching but something we're watching on a going forward basis and watching what the standard setters are doing as well as how it impacts results yes with that I'd like to thank Mark Trench for this discussion of the uh, impact that non-performance risk could have on U.S. life insurers' financial results. And from Standard & Poor's, thank you and take care.